Well, what's up, Salem? It's October 22nd. I'm Zach Zender, author of Red Letter Challenge, and you made it. You did the 40-day challenge. I hope you saw just incredible growth in your own life and in your church and in your community as you took on these five discipleship targets of be, forgive, serve, give, and go. So what's next? Uh, truthfully, my hope is that what you learned in these 40 days, that rhythm of hearing the Word of God and doing it, um, that you would practice that and continue that for the rest of your life. It really is the opportunity of a lifetime to follow Jesus. And I had such a great time on your campus to kick you off. And hey, wanted to say thanks for being a part of Red Letter Challenge. God bless you as you continue to be the great disciples of Jesus he's called you to be. Take care. Well, good morning, Salem. Funny, you're all wearing red. <laughs> Love it. A couple of people said Merry Christmas to me this morning. I've had a few people pet me. My wife's not really comfortable with that, and neither am I. So let's uh, keep your hands to yourself, okay? I understand uh, down here in the South, you guys don't understand personal space, but I'm from the Midwest, so, you know, we like have a little space, okay? Just understand that. And Mr. Escalante, I thought I was going to win today, but red blazer, like rocking and rolling. And then my uh, son's uh, girlfriend's family's all here. Uh, her mom is celebrating her birthday this weekend, has family in town from Kansas City. And I just want you to know the red isn't for your team, okay? This is just not what this is about. So we're celebrating the Red Letter Challenge. So let's whoop it up like we finished. 40 days. Way to go, Salem. Slap it up. Yeah. Woo! 40 days. I thought to myself, you know, when you go to a party, we often see banners around or you'll get cards at graduations or confirmations or weddings or all this kind of stuff where you reach this moment where you end and everybody says congratulations and nothing better than getting a card with a little check or some cash inside of it and simply says the end, like you made it, you finished. And I think one of the challenges that I face in my life, and I'm sure that some of you do as well, is when you get to the end of something like the Red Letter Challenge, the whole point of this wasn't to only do something for 40 days and have it come to an end. You see, I find that in my life, I often operate a bit like this. You know, I told you last week that I like my Peloton, check. I'm a guy that doesn't like stinky trash in my house, check. I often do some grocery shopping, check. If you come see my lawn, the lines are straight, check. Clean the garage, because it's nice outside, check. Red letter challenge, dunzo. And now I can move on with my life. I like lists. Anybody else like lists? I like making check marks. Makes me feel like I get something done every once in a while. But here's the thing. Being a disciple of Jesus isn't something that we finish. And so the whole idea of the Red Letter Challenge wasn't to get us to a point of thinking to ourselves that we've made it to the end, but rather, in some cases, for some of us, this was the beginning of something new. For some of you, you came up to me and said, Tim, this is kind of simple. And I said, well, in some ways it is, but it's a great reminder to us of the simple, simple statement that as disciples of Jesus, we're called not only to hear his words, but also to do them. And for some of you, you're somewhere in between. And what I began to realize is that life is not so much a sprint, really. It's a bit more like this. It's a marathon. I told you last week when we were talking about the whole going and the idea of the Peloton, and I told you that I ran for 70-some straight days and wound up at the chiropractor every four and was told that I wouldn't walk by the time I was 60 if I kept running like that. And I assure you that when I run, I think this is funny that this is the picture that our team chose for me. How many of you run when you look like that? <laughs> Give me a break. If I'm running, I look like a guy that's, <sighs> you're probably going to come over and try to save me and give me oxygen or something. But here's the interesting thing about marathons. The longest run I've ever done in my entire life was a 10K. I did it once in my life. Otherwise, the most I ever run is three miles. And I think that anybody that runs more than that needs to have their head checked. <laughs> Any marathon runners in here? Last service, we had two. Look at all those hands go up. <laughs> well, I'm with you. I think anybody that runs 26 miles is not right. And here's the thing, I, I just realized that if I had to run 26 miles, I just, I, I just wouldn't. I'd walk, I'd sit down, I'd quit. I, I don't know what I'd do. I'm not going to run 26 miles. I think if my life depended on it, I would just say, hey, I'm grateful to be a Christ follower. I'm going to see Jesus. But here's the thing. I've got a lady that, uh, that uh, Chris and I know the, the couple well, and this lady is just a machine. Not only does she run marathons, like she does Ironmans, which means not only does she run 26 miles, she also bikes 150 and swims too. Who does that? And she's done this multiple times. 
And as I started listening and asking questions about how you do that kind of stuff, I never thought in terms of the fact that you can't run 26 miles, bike 150, and swim two and not have to refuel your body. Now, I've never run far enough to have to worry about it. That 10K was enough, and all I had was water, and that was probably part of the problem. But the point is, is you can't do all that and not finally have to refuel. You're burning all these calories, you've got to put something back in. You've got to worry about sodium, you've got to worry about, worry about dehydration, all this stuff. But sometimes life can feel like this, can it? And depending upon where you're at in life and your age, and you start to feel like you've been running a marathon. And some of you are at the beginning of the marathon, and some of you are right in the middle, and you're trying to figure out, do I even want to keep doing this? And this whole issue of the red letter challenge of saying, I'm going to hear what God has to say and I'm going to put it into practice. It was kind of fun at the beginning, wasn't it? And I'm guessing some of you came out of the gate and read every, every day. But I bet if I asked for a show of hands this morning to ask anybody in this room that actually did every challenge, every reading, on time, the way it was supposed to be done, there might be a couple of type A folks that are going to raise their hands, but the reality is, is most of us didn't. So in some ways, we're sitting here and cheering about the fact that we kind of stumbled and barely started. But you see, that's not the point. The whole point of the red letter challenge wasn't to get to a finish line. The whole point of the red letter challenge was for us to walk together and encourage one another all the more as we see the day approaching. That's what Acts talks about. That we're in Hebrews talks about like this whole idea that we gather together and we continue to be the people of God in a movement following God, recognizing that we don't always do it right, we don't always even do it well, but we continue to do it. We continue to get up day and day and day again. And we stay in the marathon because God calls us to. And I found myself thinking, you know, this passage from Matthew 28 that we're all so familiar with, I read this last week, and if you're not familiar, I'm going to read it to you today, but I, I just started to notice certain words. It's the very end of Jesus' life here on earth, right before he's ascending back into heaven and he's got his disciples with him. He's up on a mountain. Kind of these last words, right? And he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the end of the age. And I just found myself seeing the the totality of what Jesus is saying here, and the more I was trying to think in terms of how do we tie a bow on the red letter challenge that I really don't want to tie a bow on because I don't want you to say, check, done, but at the same time, I want to look at you and go, well done, and yet on the other hand, I want to say, keep going. And what I found myself dealing with in my own heart and my own soul was sort of feeling like, oh, Like, when does it end? When do I get a break? And so when I think in terms of all nations, goodness gracious. I mean, they're saying there's somewhere between 7 and 8 billion people in the world. All nations, God? Really? I have trouble talking to my neighbors sometimes. And then we think in terms of this, teach them everything I've commanded you? Anybody want to raise their hand and say they can even recite everything God commanded you? I studied this stuff and I still feel like I half the time don't know everything God wants me to do. And then he reminds us, oh, by the way, after you do all that, don't worry because I'm going to go with you and I'll be with you to the very end of the age. I mean, like the, the longevity of this can just feel weighty as God says, this is what I want you to do as one of my disciples. And so I just found myself sort of sitting in this moment thinking to myself, Man, the marathon is daunting. I think about the only time the marathon wouldn't be daunting is maybe when I'm in the final half mile and I can see the crowd of people and maybe see the finish line. But up until that point, my goodness. This idea that life just keeps going and the call to be followers of Jesus keeps going. And people in need, desperate need of the message of hope that we have to share just keeps going. And you might think that Jesus would back off and go, it's okay, don't worry about it. But instead of John 20, he says this, peace be with you. 
As the Father has sent me, so I'm sending you. In other words, run along now. I bring peace to your life. The moment that he shares this is after he comes into the the upper room where the disciples are hanging out because they're freaked out because Jesus just got crucified. And in many ways, they're wrestling through their own emotions of, well, now what? And maybe we're next. And what in the world? This isn't what Jesus said this whole thing was going to be about. If I knew it was going to end this way, I wouldn't have followed the guy for the last three years in the first place. But then Jesus walks into the upper room and his first words are, peace. I give you. I don't know about the rest of you, but there's days in my life where I could really use a bit of peace. Some of it's my own soul and my own wiring, my need to just kind of be busy and get things done. But some of it's just the world and the things that come and the weight that I carry. and Peace. But the very next thing that he says after he tells us that he brings us peace now go. He understands it's a marathon, but he reminds us that he gives us peace. He goes with us. Now go. I don't care how tired you are. Go. I'll give it to you. Put your burden on me. Go. And we think to ourselves, ah, it's just a lot. As I was planning for this, I, I found myself drawn back to this particular piece of the story. And what's happened right before here is so Jesus is shown himself to his disciples, but his disciples are trying to figure out, okay, so we followed this guy for three years. He died and got buried, and now he's risen from the dead, and I'm really not sure what this all means. And so Peter and a couple of his buddies, the disciples are hanging out, and it says, it happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together, so five of these guys, right? And they came up with this plan. They said, you know what? I bet Jesus is going to send back up into heaven and he's going to call us to start the church and he's going to send the Holy Spirit and this explosion is going to take place and we're going to lead the church and change the world. Nope. Peter went back to what he knew. You see, when Jesus called the disciples, if you remember correctly, he was going around to people that others might not choose and he found these guys that were fishing. And we're really quite accomplished at it, right? And he calls them and he says, nothing wrong with fishing. And there's still nothing wrong with fishing. But here's the thing I want you to understand. There's something better. And so I don't want you just to fish. I want you to fish for people. I want you to have an eternal purpose and value. I want you to realize that I've created you for more than just catching fish. But I know for me, when I get tired or overwhelmed, maybe a little uncomfortable, I go back to what I know. And the things that I know I can do, and I can do them well. And so that's exactly what happened here. The disciples went back in a boat, and they decided they were going to go do what they're still good at. But here's the interesting thing that happens. You see, after you encounter Jesus, we all know this to be true, but when we encounter Jesus, nothing ever remains the same. You don't look at the world the same. Some of us hearken back to a day that was. I mean, think about when life starts to get a little bit icky or you're looking back, depending upon where you're at in this marathon of life, and you start looking back on some golden years or some golden moments, and you kind of want to go back to those moments. But here's the thing. It never is the same. So Peter, the master fisherman, goes and Five guys go with them, and they go out into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. And then a guy shows up on the shore and says, hey, how's it going out there? If you're a master fisherman and somebody shows up on the shore and asks you how your fishing's going and it isn't going well, I'm guessing that's not a question you really want to answer. Probably part of you that wants to lie, but eventually you've got to show up on shore and show that you didn't catch anything frustrating night. It didn't go back to the way it used to be. And then Jesus from the shore says, put your net on the other side. And those of you that know the story knows what happened. Suddenly the net was so full that it began to break. And immediately when that happened, the disciples knew. They knew that the man on the shore was Jesus. And what it reminded them of and what it reminded me of as I was going through the story again this week was, here's the thing. You can't go back. 
Once you encounter Jesus, your life is never the same. You can't go back to what it was. You look at life differently. You have a totally different lens. And you're reminded of the fact that it isn't dependent on you because you'll notice the guys that were really good fishermen, even that they couldn't do the same anymore. They still had to depend on Jesus. I love that. And then, just after Jesus gives them that final command, he was taken up before their eyes and a cloud hid him from their sight. I think there's been moments in my life where I sort of feel like, where'd God go? I just imagine what the conversation was with the disciples as they were walking down the mountain that day. They'd seen things nobody else had seen, experienced moments that nobody else had experienced. They had the inner circle of Jesus. They gave up three years of their lives. They couldn't go back. Life was never going to be the same. And then suddenly the guy just descends into heaven and he says, oh, by the way, I'm going to send my counselor, the Holy Spirit, and you go hang out in Jerusalem. He'll be here shortly. (laughs) Can you just imagine these guys walking down a hill going, hey, Peter, any idea what that means? Like, really? So they walked down the hill, went back to Jerusalem. And I waited. I'm guessing there's moments in our lives where we kind of feel like God just tells us to wait. Other times where he doesn't feel like he's very present. Other moments where you feel like you're trying to do everything that he's calling you to do, but there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of fruit. What keeps us going? And I'm reminded, once you're a disciple, the call on your life simply changes. Because everything in our culture and our world says that it's about you, it's about your pleasure, it's about your attainment of things, of stuff, of rank, of whatever it might be. And what we find as Christ followers is when Jesus gets a hold of us, we begin to realize it's really not about us in the first place, it never was. And that we're here for a short time. Scripture says we're here for like a mist. Here today, gone tomorrow. And so Jesus looks at his disciples and says, once you're a disciple, you you make disciples. I mean, that's what you do. So Jesus is looking at his disciples who've walked this whole journey with him. He says, here's what I want you to do. These red letters, my words, feed my sheep. And this is in the context of Jesus forgiving Peter for denying him and the shame and the guilt that Peter was carrying. And he looks at Peter and goes, it's wiped away. Peace. Now go. And then he reminds them of this. Look, you don't go by yourself and really you can't do it by yourself. He says, here's what I want you to do. A new command, right? Here we go can feel like he's lumping it on. Love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. How? Because disciples do this. They love one another. Here's the challenge of the church. Sometimes I think we're the worst example of this on planet Earth. Sometimes we're better at loving our neighbor and loving total strangers than we are loving the people that we're closest to. The amount of infighting within the church sometimes is just fascinating to me. The stuff we choose to argue about, goodness gracious. Like there's people dying and going to hell and we argue about weird stuff. It's just what we do. And then I look at that command and I go, Jesus, I don't even like the guy. And you're telling me that that's how I demonstrate I'm a disciple? So how do we learn to operate like this? Feed my lambs. Let the mark of a disciple be that we love one another. And then we jump out of the red letters and we go to Paul's letter to the Christians in Colossians. And he says, for this reason, since the day we heard about you. So think about this, Salem. I want you to hear these words from Paul to Salem, not the church in Colossus for just a moment. So for this reason, since the day we heard about you, Salem, we haven't stopped praying for you. Imagine that, just the power of someone praying over you constantly. And look what the prayer is. We continually ask God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all the wisdom and understanding that the Spirit gives. 
so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord. Please him everywhere, bearing fruit in every good work. It's good to know that the Spirit helps, right? But this concept of living a life that's worthy, doing the good works, making sure that I please him, I mean, there's just the side of you that just goes, man, this is heavy. And so as I wrap up the red letter challenge, we kind of started here and then we walked through this whole idea of being, forgiving, serving, giving, going, all these things that we're called to do. And I want to remind you where we started as we close out 40 days together. You see, if there's a word I want you to remember, it's and. Hear and do. But you know what makes you a disciple? It's not the doing. Never was. You see, it's this constant reminder that what makes a fruit tree produce fruit is the fact that it's a fruit tree. And you can't get that backwards. You don't call it a fruit tree because it produces fruit. It produces fruit because it's a fruit tree. And so you're not a disciple because of what you do. You do what you do because you're a disciple. So what made you a disciple in the first place? If it's not what you do, if you can't earn it, it's this. We kind of hang on to this and it can feel like this is the compression of the whole thing. As Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, that makes you one of my disciples. That's not what he said. He didn't say that's what makes you a disciple. It says, this is what my disciples do. They hold to my teaching. That demonstrates that you're a disciple. It doesn't make you one. Hang on. And then he goes to this, I'm the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I'm in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So how do you bear fruit? It's not on your own accord. It's because you're connected to the vine. The vine produces the fruit. Apart from me, you do nothing. Friends, hang on to the fact and don't walk out of this place anything but encouraged Regardless of how well you did on the red letter challenge, no matter how tired you feel in your life, no matter whether you participated or didn't participate, whether you find yourself wanting to just go back and fish, I want you to hear grace today. Because this is what disciples do, but this isn't what made you a disciple. For it's by grace, grace, never forget this. That's what saved you. And what connects you to the grace is the faith. It's not from yourself. You see, faith is a gift from God that connects you to this, which is what saves you. Friends, it's, none of that is about what you do. It's not about works. Never was. Never will be. Paul closes it out this way, he says, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do these things. But notice that God prepared them in advance for us to do. Friends, walk out of this place with your head held high. Not because you're so great, but because God is so great. His mercies are new every morning. He loves you all the way to the cross he walked out of a tomb so that you and I might be set free from the shame and the guilt that we tend to carry. And that's what I want to leave you with this morning. A reminder that we are set free because I told you that motive matters when we were talking about serving. I kind of said, look, you can do things for the right reason and the wrong reason. I realize the result might be the same to the person that receives it. But motive matters. What drives you matters. And so we don't do what we do because we're trying to earn anything or get a high five from God or get a better room in heaven. That's not the point. You produce fruit because you're a fruit tree. You make disciples because God made you a disciple by grace. I'll leave you with this verse. It's for freedom that Christ sets you free. It's Paul's words to the church in Galatia. It's just a reminder to us that each one of us needs to be set free and 
you want an assignment this week, go back and read Galatians 5 because it's this reminder to us that we've been set free, been set free from the guilt and the shame and the things that we carry. So stop carrying it. And the whole goal that we get is this privilege, right? We're set free to do these things. We've been talking about we can be with Jesus. We can forgive others. We can serve in a way in which our motive is appropriate. We give generously and we go out and we are ambassadors and give testimony to before Jesus, after Jesus. That's who we are. We are witnesses to who he is. All for what purpose? This. So we can help set others free. That's it. You're saved by grace, and then you're sent. So live in grace and approach each day in freedom. Let's pray. Father God, we thank and praise you for the privilege of being able to gather together in your house. As we celebrate this 40-day 40 40 challenge, I guess in some ways it might feel like 40 years for some, but this 40-day challenge, it's a great opportunity for to celebrate what you've done in this church, what you've done in individuals' lives, what you've done in our community, through people who've served and given and gone and given testimony and been living generously. And as we learn to just be with you, all those disciplines of being a disciple, God, but the thing that we're reminded of most of all is the fact that in the presence of a perfect and a holy God, no matter how hard we try, we fall short. Sometimes even our goal of doing these things is to if we're not careful to gain your attention. It's a motive matters, God. It's a reminder today that what gives us the ability to do what we do and the reason we're disciples isn't because of what we do and not because we got first in line and you noticed, but rather what you accomplished on the cross in the empty tomb. So God, this morning we ask that you would continue to move and work in our lives, that we would be people of hope, people that do our best to live out those red letters but recognize that we so often fall and in that is the testimony it's the witness to your grace in our lives and the fact that you've set us free and in setting us free God you give us the privilege of setting others free so to that end we give thanks for what you've accomplished in the last 40 days and we ask for your continued spirit as we watch to see what you continue to do in the days ahead God, these things we ask in your precious and holy name.